about how God protected this week. Think about how he fed you. Uh, you know, we, we got so much. Just take a list. One time I was in uh, uh, preaching at a church, and, and I used a lot of illustrations. I said, Lord, just give me things that people never forget. Never forget. So I know this sounds terrible, but it worked. They never forgot this. <laughs> I, I, I was home, and I was preparing for it, and I ended up getting a, a, a toilet paper roll. And on each, each little sheet, uh -huh. I wrote one blessing. Okay? I just wrote one blessing. And I'm telling you what, by the time I got just half of it unwound, well, I'm stretching, buddy. Thank God for the right thumb, left thumb, you know, when I was doing that. Thank you. Oh, thank you for eyeballs. Thank you for all just running out. And then the next day I took, I went to church and I had people stand up and I stretched that all the way across the church. And I had people say what's on that, just on the side where you're at. They never forget that. And, they realize, and I didn't even get the whole world done. Yeah. I said, that's what you ought to think about. You ought to think about how many blessings you actually have in your life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we think about our, our kids. We think about our grandkids. That's a blessing. Yeah. That's a blessing to be able to see your grandkids. Yes. It's a blessing to be able to pray for your grandkids. It's a blessing to be able to pray for those people around you. I, I run to people all the time. And you know what? People want somebody to pray for. Them. Yeah. People want somebody to lock arms with and say, you know what, I'm going to be with your brother in this. Yeah. I had an individual share some things. He stopped by the school the other day and, and remember me and we was talking. He kind of shared some things. You know, said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. That's a privilege yes. to take those burdens, those things you have yes. to God and pray for them. And you know what? I always figure if you're going to pray, you need to believe what you're praying for. Yeah. Okay? Yes. You know, I mean, go to God, and you know, the thing about it is that we don't have to have that inner, inner meter like that they did in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go, because mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus died, he went to bed. Yeah. And so we can go into the holies of holies, yeah. and we can touch God. Yeah. There's there's nothing that God, like you, uh, Lee and I were just talking about it, you know, that when you praise God and you thank for what yeah, he's done in your life. It seems like he gives you more to thank him for and praise him for. Yes. But when you complain, you're constantly complaining. God don't like that. Because you're complaining, well, God, I don't really uh, appreciate what you gave me. I would rather have this. Uh, one, one, one time I ended up getting blessed with a, with a car. It was a minivan. And the guy showed, and I do not like green. I mean, it's just a color. I just, that's not my color, you know. And so I went down to the dealership, and guess what the car was they had for me? It was green. And I thought, Lord, you know, you know, and he, and he speaking to heart said, you know, Tim, you asked for a vehicle. Yeah. You didn't say you wanted blue. You didn't want to say you wanted black. You said you need a good vehicle. You want to get it done today. Yes. I said, yes, that's true, Lord. And so I said, I'll just take it. I'm going to be quiet. So my son was with me, and they took the car uh, while we was getting all the finances done, and they, and they washed it, and they put it in the showroom in this little room that, that and it had all these lights on it. And when I came back, because I was looking for him, looking for John, wondering where he was at, and he was sitting in the car, and all these lights shine on that car. Uh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You were right all along. Because you were willing to bless me. And you got to be able to receive that blessing. And if we, if we look at Psalms 103, 11, and think about how much God loves you. I love Pastor been talking about that. But that's what we have to get, is an image of how much God loves us. Because that, then that gets you through a lot of things. You know, people do a lot of things and they feel that nobody loves them. Nobody cares for them. But I'm telling you, there's one that's always going to care for you. There's one that's never going to give up on you. There's one that puts his arm around you. That's what I had. A uh, brother-in-law used to say when, when God was blessing him, he'd say, oh, Tim, God's got his arms around you. You know, he's smiling over there. And I thought, man, he does that for everybody. If you just let God come into your heart and make you brand new, that's the big difference. Yes. And in Psalms 103, 11, it says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great his mercy and love and kindness toward those who reverently and worship the fear of man. You get that picture? As for how, how close to heaven? Sometimes heaven seems closer, sometimes it seems far away. Mm -hmm. But that gap, you know, God loves you that much. Uh, one night I was flying into Philadelphia, and they had to put us in a holding pattern. And, you know, holding pattern is really weird because you know the airplane can't sit still like a, like a helicopter. So you know it's going around. But because it, it, they had a thunderstorm, they wouldn't let us land. And then it kind of cleared up. And I remember just kind of setting. I like to sit over the wing. Some people don't, but I like to look over the wing. And it just seemed like we were up in the clouds, you know. And it seemed like God was right at the end of the wing. Mm -hmm. He just seemed yeah. that close to me. Yeah. Like I was like, man, I can just get out and walk and touch God. 
you know, because it seemed that close to me. And I was just thankful. They said, well, what's holding this airplane up? God's holding the airplane up. Yeah. You can look at all the mechanics and stuff like that. But if it wasn't for God, exactly. none of that, we know the airplanes do crash and stuff, you know. Yeah. But i got to trust God that there was a bed because he was always afraid of flying. Because he said, what if the pilot had a heart attack or something like that? I said, well, you got to trust God. And once you get off the ground, you can't change your mind, yeah. you know. <laughs> I mean, you can't say, that. I, I think I decided I'm going to stay on the ground. I remember the first time taking off, I just closed my eyes and realized, I'm up here in the heavens. You know who lives in the heavens? God lives in the heavens. Yeah, right. But you know, God's also on the earth, and God also can't get any closer because God's inside you. Yeah. That's the thing. He lives inside you. You hear that still, small voice? Yeah. And one, one thing, this last thing I'm going to share real quick. I love 4610, Psalm 4610. Because that verse tells you, oh, let, you know, let be and still, let be and be still, and know, recognize, and understand that I am God. Yes. Yes. Sometimes we just need to be still. We run around a lot, run around. Sometimes, you know, prayers are a two-way communication, right? You know, we talk to God, but God talks to us. We say, well, how do I know what God is trying to tell me to do? I said, first, you got to listen to him. Yeah. Listen to him and tell you what to do. Amen. Okay? He will guide you. Okay? He's walking, holding your hand. He will tell you what to do. He will open the right door. Yeah. God can say, don't go this way. Go this way. You hear that still, small yeah. voice? I've heard it say. I, I got one of the best jobs, wedding advertised or anything. I went to, actually went to another place I was going to, and I felt God wanted me to, to turn in his parking lot. So you know what I did? I turned in that parking lot, right. and I went in and told him what kind of license I had. He said, you know what? We've been looking for a guy like you. I did not know that. The job wasn't even advertised, but God knew it. Yes. Yes. That's, what, that's what I'm saying. That's how it works. Right. Same way when I got the job at DMAC, my daughter said, well, Daddy, I see the DMAC trucks. Why don't you go over and just talk to them and, and see, you know, about working for them and get the truck. I said, okay. I went over, and guess what? I went in there and talked to them. Guess what? Yeah, we're interested in hiring two people right now. Right now. Yeah. I came up in February of 2007, start working in March of 2007. Yeah. You know, who was that? Who was that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's God yeah. there. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. God can guide you. A lot of times we just need to be still and let God be God. Yeah. Yeah. We need to learn to trust Him. Yeah. And you know, I'll tell you what, it's hard to trust God in those difficult times. Yeah. But that tells you of your character, right? We say, God, I don't understand this. I don't get what's going on. But I know one thing, you're still God, yeah. no matter what. Amen. Okay? Amen. You know, there's times when your tears, you, you can cry. I've probably been there when you cry so much that you're still crying, but the tears won't come anymore. Our tears are so precious to God, he puts them in a bottle yeah. and records them in a book. You know, in Psalm 56, 8, 9, says, for this I know, God is for me. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? That's what it is. God is for you, and that's what he's telling you today. God is for you today. He's for you every day. He's on your team. You know, we always want to be on the winning side. Well, we can't never be on the losing side with Jesus Christ. He's on the, he, he is the winner. He's the one, you know, you think about him. And yes, he deserves the praise.
mean, some didn't have nothing. I mean, nothing, nothing. But I, I remember those days. Yeah. You know, we used to always joke about, you know, wish sandwiches. We ate plenty of those. You know, <laughs> two pieces of bread, wish you had some meat. Let me tell you. We had plenty of those, man. Man ate sandwiches, but let me tell you. That ain't where I was to be. But now, you know, that's the thing you don't have to worry about. Yeah. You know, when you put your uh, car in the ATM and hope there's somebody left. <laughs>
secretary at the hospital, the one who was given two weeks to live because of her cancer, uh, she did agree to undergo some of the treatments and everybody up there is praying for her and telling her that it doesn't matter, you know, if you take the treatments or you rely on God, he's the ultimate healer. Amen. And so the two weeks are up and now they've extended it to six months. Amen. And she said, you know, they told her, that's just their report. That's not the reality. The reality is God's going to heal you. Yes. You Amen. have to keep that in your mind. Amen. You are healed. Yeah. And so we're just continuing to pray for our Diane and that she will have complete mm -hmm. healing in her body. Yeah. Amen. 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 I don't know if everybody saw this, but it blew my mind. I was watching Channel 13 um, one day this week, and there was a little girl in Waukee, a little girl, cheerleader, very pretty little girl. Was why she was on the hood of a car, I don't know, but last fall yeah. she fell off. The guy, you know, mm -hmm. took off and she fell off and hit her head on the concrete. Mm -hmm. She was given 1% chance of survival, 99% chance that she would mm -hmm. not make it. And they said that through, you know, brain scans and all, her, her brain, no activity, plus it had begun to shrink, which they said is just, there was no hope. So they said they need to take her off of uh, everything. Well, this is the part I didn't understand, but I heard him say a doctor, but what it was was her chiropractor from earlier that he said he was just compelled. It would not leave him alone to go lay hands on her and pray for her in the hospital. And he said he, he just resisted until it would, it just, he had to do it. Amen. Now, here's where I'm confused. I don't know if it was 18 hours or 18 days, whatever it was, she came to, they showed her on TV, she graduated. She's perfectly normal, except she has no long-term memory of her childhood, which that can be restored easily. Yeah. But they said, you talk, even all the doctors said, you talk about a miracle. And I thought, it happens all the time. Yeah. But the news people choose right. usually to downplay it. Yeah. Yeah. But that guy, thank God, he was obedient. Oh, he and went right. in and laid he hands on her. Now that, it, that's beyond uh, medical. They said there's no hope. None. And that's what we need to encourage the other lady with and yep. say, hey, listen, this girl had her brain had even started to shrink. I, I didn't know it did that, but they said, yeah, when it's, when you're done, they, your brain just contracts. Yeah. Now she's perfect. I couldn't, showed her. She was just perfectly bubbly. You'd never know she ever got injured.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Tim. He didn't know he was going to open up till uh, five minutes till. He's such a blessing. Such a blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Y'all ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just want to be in your presence. We just want to love on you. We just want to glorify your holy name for you alone are worthy. This day is yours and yours alone. Light of the world. 
you stepped out in the darkness open my eyes let me see the beauty that made this heart to do you hope of the life spent with you here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely you're all together worthy all together wonderful to me Cause King of all days, you're so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that If you have a need this morning, call it out to the Lord. Call it out to the Lord. If you have a need, call it out. He is here right now, church. We need to reach out. We need to reach out. Tum the hedge of his garment. Touch the hem of his garment. Come on, church. We need to do it right now. Come on now. Call upon the name of the Lord. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon. Just thank Him. Just thank Him. I thank Him. No, how much it costs. I'll never sin upon that cross. I love.
Cause here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, that you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Just tell me you love them, church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. You're my healer. You're my healer. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and praise your holy name. Oriya bashanala yalala. There's healing in your wings. There's healing in your wings. Healing in your wings, Lord. Healing in your presence is where I want to be, oh Lord. than silver Lord you are more finer than gold Lord you are more precious than silver Tell me you love the church. Thank you, Lord. 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 This is where I want to be. 
in your healing presence, Lord. Take the coughing away, Lord. Take the coughing away, Lord. Breathe into lungs this morning, Lord. Breathe into lungs this morning, Lord. Breathe into the sinuses. Breath of heaven. Inhabit the praises of your people. As each inhale is taken, as each breath is taken in, Lord, let your healing balm coat the lungs, clear the lungs, clear the sinuses. Your presence is all we need, Lord. Your presence is all we need, Lord. Your presence is what we need, Lord. Your presence is what we need, Lord. Your presence.
Lift your voice. Lift your voice. There will be no one like you and no one beside you alone. You are worthy of all praise. There will be no one like you and no Step in the river, church.
Isaiah 43, verse 19, it says something that, in a way that I hadn't read it before, but it says, Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. And I believe the Lord is speaking to us and saying, when we rest in His finished work, we're blind to the symptoms, to the circumstances, to the situations. We're deep to the diagnosis and the uh, words of the uh, bankers and our financial uh, people. We don't listen to this world. We don't look to this world for our answers. We look to the Lord. And he's pleased in that righteousness. That, that is righteousness, church. It's total confidence in God. It's faith in Him and His finished work. That's what God calls righteous. He said to Abraham, He said, uh, Abraham believed God and God counted it as righteousness. All he did was believe God. He, he had flaws. He had faults. But he didn't consider his own body or the deadness of Sarah's womb. And in another place it says, they didn't think about the land that they'd come from or they may have had a temptation to go back. Praise the Lord. We, we just need to focus on what God says and rejoice in that righteousness, knowing that God can do anything and is willing to do everything for those who can believe. Amen. Amen. Give him a big hand tonight, or this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. Thank you very much. You all may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. Great. Thank you, Tim, for opening the service. Does a great job. We appreciate him so much stepping up and sharing his giftings and anointings with us. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That decision was taken right out of her hands. Praise the only one, The only one today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, Sunday school kids, you can go. You know, we talk about faith, and a lot of times we make it such a big, confusing issue, when in fact it's just, it is just simply believing God. You know, under the Old Covenant, the people... Uh, Under the Old Covenant, people never really exercised faith outside of the long-term faith in the sacrifices. About got it back there, folks? Praise the Lord. 
And uh, because of that, when Christ came, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't identify with him. And in the new covenant, it is simply about faith. It isn't about works. The trouble with, with works is not that we shouldn't want to do good things, but the problem is we begin to trust in our behaviors rather than trusting in God. And that's what Jesus came to deliver us from, the works of the law. Under the old covenant, there wasn't a great deal of need for faith because they were focused totally on what they were doing, on the rules and on the regulations. And uh, that's the danger of religion, even up to this day, is that it takes our eyes off of the finished work of Christ and puts it back on the work that we're trying to do, trying to accomplish or trying to achieve. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Praise the Lord. In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Praise the Lord. All right, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So as a, as a believer, we are not what we do. Praise the Lord. We are children of God, fully belonging to Jesus Christ. You're not your own. You've been purchased. Amen? And some people think that we aren't really righteous, you know, that, that it isn't a, a reality that, that we're just seen by God as if we're righteous. That God kind of has a pair of righteous glasses that he puts on and he looks through them and he just kind of says they're righteous even though we're really not righteous. Amen? Uh, kind of that we don't have any real righteousness here and now on planet earth. But instead what God does is uh, he's up in heaven and he's basically pretending that we are righteous. That's what a lot of people believe. Or he just, he doesn't really look at us because we're so repulsive and unrighteous that he just looks at Jesus. Right. Yeah. Amen? So he just looks at Jesus instead of having to look at us because the way it's taught in many ways is that we are not really righteous. We just have a kind of a facade or something that, that's really just about Jesus. And, and so whenever we do evil Jesus kind of jumps in front of God as if that were possible and blinds him to our humanity or our reality. Amen? Look at, look at John chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. All right? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And we go over these things because I really believe that God is ready for a great, I don't even want to I don't know what to call it, but a great awakening, yeah. awareness, a revelation of who we are in Christ so that we will really begin to do what only God can do. Amen? But it's us got to do it. Praise the Lord. 
There has to be, just like this chiropractor, for example, that just felt had to do it. Go pray for this gal. And look what God does. He's a chiropractor. He's not a preacher. He's not an evangelist. You know, I mean, he's a child of God, obviously. He's a believer in Christ or he wouldn't have went. God wants this on a massive scale. But people have to be confident. And they got to know that they can do it. They can do it. You can do it. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? All right. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Amen. Now, we've read that religiously as though it, once you get born again, you're never going to sin. If you do, you're not really born again, or there's something flawed about your born againness. That's bogus. That's not true. If you are born again, you cannot commit sin because your sins have all been eradicated. We have become innocent as Adam was in the, in the creation and even greater than that because we, we can't sin because there's no law for us to break. Right. The law has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. So that's us. That's describing us. Yes. Now, I know people get nervous because they say, well, you know, the people are just going to go out and sin. You're sinning anyhow if you use the law as a criteria. Because Jesus set the bar so high that nobody can pass it. Exactly. If you think a thought, it's the same as if you've done it. Yeah. We think thoughts. Exactly. And they're not always good thoughts. They only may be last for a moment, but it's still there. The thought still came. Amen. We are not sinners. No. No. We are saints. We were sinners. We're no longer sinners. Hallelujah. We cannot sin. That's right. <laughs> That's, listen, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Yes. Amen. Yes. I don't care what any preacher says. I don't care what any, anybody says. You cannot sin. You can do bad stuff. Mm -hmm. You can do things that are harmful to yourself and to others. You can do things that are very negative. You can do things that are not a good witness to represent Christ. But you cannot sin. Because we are born of God. Does God have any sin? No, we got born by Adam who had sinned, and therefore got, we got his sin nature. We got what he had already done before we did anything. We were sinners in our mother's womb. Because we had Adam as a father. We get born again. We don't do anything. In the born again experience, we are born of God. Exactly. There is no sin in God. Therefore, there is no sin in us. Amen. Amen. In the born again experience. Praise the Lord. God birthed us spiritually. So we are actually new and different at our core at what is really us exactly. in our human spirit. Amen. We are new creatures. We are perfect. Yes. We are righteous. We are holy. We are exactly like God. Yes. Amen? Yes. Evolution, we, we, we don't believe that junk. Amen? I believe cows beget cows. Yeah. Pigs beget pigs. Apes beget apes. Exactly. There's, no, there's no evidence. There's no proof of, a, of evolution. It is a theory. It's taught as though it were a fact, as though it were truth. But we've never found anything that would link one species to another. Everything begets after its own kind. The Bible tells us that in the very beginning. So when God begets, he begets... God's. That's exactly right. 
Oh, boy, he's, this is close to blasphemy. No, this is exactly what Jesus taught. Because he said he was a son of God, the son of God, they said he's a blasphemer. He's making himself equal with God. The Bible tells us as he is, so are we. We are in Christ. We got to get rid of a lot of this just foolish religious thinking if we're ever going to be able to move. The reason Jesus was able to do the things he did was because he expected that he would do it. He felt it was his that was his role. That was his job. That was what he did. He just did it naturally. It's not me that does the works. It's the spirit that's in me. Sure. It's God that's in me. He does the works. Amen. Well, you know, uh, he, he's healing on the Sabbath. Then he says, your sins are forgiven. Get up and go home. Oh, my God, they freaked. They were pulling their curls out. They were going nuts. <laughs> Who can forgive sin? But God, exactly. there's another place in the Bible where it says, whosoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Uh-huh. I'll tell you something about the authority that God has given you, yes. the way God sees you. That is real righteousness. It's not a facade. It's not some cliche. It's not, it's not some transference of God's just ability to not see us evil. It's God has declared us righteous. We were born from God. That is real righteousness. It's not a pretend righteousness, but it's real righteousness. The kind that brings power right here on earth. Amen. Amen. The kind that will move situations and circumstances Amen. It's not something that just comes along later, just an instant before we walk into heaven. It's something we have right now. And it's by that righteousness we have authority over the unrighteous, over the enemy, over the devil, and all the works of the devil, which is sin, sickness, disease, poverty. All the negative things that are in this world are not coming from God. In fact, none of them come from God. They come from the fallen one. He has given us authority over over him, and it's by righteousness that we have that authority, and the devil knows you're righteous. He hates you because of your righteousness. You have been declared what he can never be. Perfect. Godlike. What did he want? I will be like God. Tough luck, buddy. You're never, it's never going to happen, but it's already happened for us. He sees God in us. That's why he hates us. He doesn't hate our humanity. He could care less. He hates the God that God has, has placed in us and made us to be after his likeness. So we better wise up that we cannot defeat him in the flesh. You can't defeat him no matter how good you are, how much good you do. You can only defeat him by the power of the Spirit of God that dwells within you. Amen. The righteousness of God that you have by the born again experience. We've got a real enemy. We're facing him every day. We're hearing the, the testimonies and the, and the pray, prayer requests. Uh, what, about what? About the enemy's work. About what the enemy is doing, amen, in our city, in our town, in our families, in ourselves. Somebody has got a man up, spirit up, I guess would be a better way of saying it, and start taking responsibility and authority over that devil. The way Jesus did. These works and greater works shall you do. How in the world can that happen if we are not born of God? If we are not children of God? If we have not God quality? If we live by faith and not by sight, I I think it goes further than just looking at a bad situation saying, I don't don't believe that. No, I got to look in the mirror and say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that last action. I don't believe that last word. I don't believe that last thought. I believe what God has declared that I am the righteousness of God and demons have to bow, amen, when I speak the name of Jesus because it's my name. He has given me his name. He didn't just give us a, 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 you know, a, a, 
a, a word to use like a rubbing a rabbit's foot. He gave me his name. He gave me his authority. He gave me his identity in Christ. And that's what the world needs to see. They need to see it, but they need to see it in love. Not in some nasty hate speech that, that we see all the time from Christians. But the, the, a demonstration of God's love. Not his anger. Not his judgment. There'll be plenty of time for anger and judgment in the final judgment. That's the only time it's going to happen. And it'll only happen to people who haven't accepted the love of God in Christ. Then the only thing left is wrath. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Why don't you see something? People are thinking, well, we're still working towards something. Well, yes, we are. We all want to be better. On any level, if you've got a job, you want to get better at your job, I would imagine. Unless you're a union. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I've been a union. I've done both, praise the Lord. But it's still up to the individual. And if you don't have any sense of wanting to get better at what it is you do, then you ought to be doing something else, to be quite honest with you. But, the, but the, the bottom line is, as humans, we always want to get better. Right? I mean, we want the marriage to be better. We want our relationships to improve, to get better. And it happens by working at it. Yeah. By focusing on it. By doing something about it, right? So, when we talk about Christian life, we think in those same kinds of terms that i got to be a better Jesus, a better God-man, a better Christian. Yes, we want that, but there's, there's, a, there's a different way in the spirit than what there is in the flesh. We're not going to get perfect a split second before we die or a split second after we die. There's no, there's no Bible for that, but that's what we teach. We're, we're trying to get good enough so that at some point we'll just walk with God and then yeah. be not. Yeah. Hey, he didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't have a seal of God. He wasn't born of God. I'm talking about Enoch now. He didn't have anything that you got outside of his knowledge of God, his awareness of God. Mm-hmm. So we're not trying to just be more and more and more like Jesus in hopes that at some point before I die or when I die, I'll squeak in. I'll, I'll, I'll get a, a boost of adrenaline, Holy Ghost adrenaline, and it'll, it'll put me over. Amen? Look at Rome, here's a, and, that, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Our spirit is perfect, it's groaning for the perfect body because it's stuck with the one it's got. It's stuck with one who isn't redeemed. You all know your body did not get redeemed. What got redeemed, what got born of God, God is a spirit. He doesn't give birth to flesh. He created it, but he doesn't give birth to it. He had to have a man and a woman in order for himself, the spirit of God, to come into this world. He had to have a flesh, a body, thou hast prepared for me. Or he wouldn't, you know, or he wouldn't have went through the whole genealogy showing us that, you know, he escaped the, the, the uh, male side, which would have given him the Adamic nature. Right? He didn't have that. He doesn't go back to Adam. So God, that's what he's trying to get us to understand is that, what we are, the God in us, the spirit of us, is groaning for a like body, something that fits, something that matches. Now, how many of y'all feel just not always comfortable in this body? Yeah. Yeah. You just don't quite fit. It's what we got, and thank God we've got it because it gives us legal right to operate on this planet. But it's still, it still ain't right. It's still not like the spirit. Right? The spirit wants to leap over walls and run through a troop. The body wants to lay down and hide. It wants to just, just give up, you know, and quit. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2.
For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. A house that's from the same place we're from. Yeah. The house, notice it's the house. It's not us, but it's the house. I have this theory, and maybe others have had it, but I, you know, if you see acts of valor, great, great heroism, someone is having an out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you're, you're not thinking of your existence. Right. You're not thinking of what's this going to happen to me? Am I, am I going to get a hole in here? Am I going to get my head blown off? Am I going to lose a leg? There's just something happens that separates you in that moment of heroism or whatever you want to call it where you aren't thinking about you. Right. You're thinking of somebody else. You're thinking of some other thing, something higher, something grander, something greater. You don't have to be a Christian to do that, but it is a Christ-like act where you're not functioning from all of the uh, rules and regulations and expectations of this fleshly world. Mm -hmm. It's an out of body. It's, a, it's outside of the body. It's pure spirit. And why? Because the spirit knows it's not going to die. Not even sinner. They don't die. They're going to live somewhere. But they're going to live wherever it is separated from God. Praise the Lord. So... In this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Praise the Lord. There is no mention there in either of those scriptures, or any other scripture for that matter, of any last minute fix spiritually. Because in our spirit, we've already been changed. We've already been perfected. One scripture talks about the, uh, the assembly of God, the the. Mount Zion and, and, and those uh, who, whose spirits have been made perfect, already done, already finished. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who do no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are heaven ready on the inside now, have been from the moment you were born again. Yes. Heaven's yours. It's wide open. There's no change has to take place. You just have to get out of the body to do it right now because this body can't go there, wherever there is. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know we think of the heavenlies, but, but there's other stuff in the heavenlies too. It's a dimension, whatever it is, wherever it is. And this body can't go there. But our heavenly body can because Jesus demonstrated it for us right here on earth after he was resurrected. He comes walking through walls. He, it's not subject to matter and, 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 and the same laws, quote unquote, that, that, that our natural bodies are subject to here on earth. Even gravity has no con control. you got your own gravity. You want to be here, you're here. If you don't want to be here, you let loose and you're gone. You're somewhere else. I mean, why wouldn't our spirits want that body? Because it's trapped. <laughs> it's trapped in, a, in an earthen vessel that is so much lower than our reality. Amen? So God has actually changed us in a, in a tangible way. Or has he? That's, that's what our minds wrestle with all the time. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. As he is. Herein is our, is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. When the day of judgment comes, don't worry about it. You're not going to be judged. Your judgment has already taken place. Our love is made perfect. In other words, we can love God and it's accepted by God because we've been made sinless. We've been made a child of God. He can respond. He can, he can accept us into his presence. Amen? Because as he is, 
so are we in this world. Now, either that's true, or we've got a question about everything else in the Bible, too. If there's one thing that's wrong, then there could be anything wrong, and all of it could be wrong. So, I mean, what do you do with this as a religious person? Well, I know one thing they do, because I've heard it preached many a times. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Now, if Paul's a sinner, don't try to tell me you're not. Right? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, that really blows my theology right there. Praise the Lord. Not really. Because if you read it in the context, we are not simultaneously sinners and saints. It's impossible. Paul was talking about his former life as a killer of Christians. If you back up to 1 Timothy 1, let's, let's begin at verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I saw a sign the other day said this was an, uh, I'm indigent, indigent, give me money, spelled indigent with a J. I told, uh, I forget who was with me, I said, uh, they're, they're not indigent, they're ignorant. Okay, never mind. Praise the Lord. Who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should thereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He, is, he wasn't a sinner when he said it. He was saying, I was, but because of the abundance of God's grace, I've been delivered from all of that because I was ignorant and unbelief. Even though I was a very religious person, I was ignorant when it came to the, th the truth of what those same scriptures were trying to teach me. Praise the Lord. The, the point is, no matter what our former identity, no matter what we might have been, we have a new identity. Holy, blameless, righteous. You know who you really are? Look at, look at John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, look at uh, John 17, verses 2 and 3. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Praise the Lord. So eternal life isn't your life made better. Eternal life isn't your life made longer. Eternal life is Christ's life. Yes. Yes. Power, listen to this, power over all flesh. Now the flesh is not this thing. Flesh is strategies. <coughs> Flesh is ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Amen? Just like righteousness is ways of doing things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That act literally translates seek first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things. Because otherwise you're in the flesh. Yeah. But we have power over all of the strategies of the devil. 
What are his strategies? They're all flesh. They're all fleshly. They're all sense. We have it because we are in Christ. God sees me. He sees righteousness. He doesn't see a blank of Jesus in front of me. He sees me as though I were Jesus. Because I, he was just the firstborn of many brethren. I'm an heir, a joint heir with Christ. I have equal status with Christ. Now get this. Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God. Jesus Christ is God. He's just God in the flesh. Woo! Hallelujah. Why? Because he has God's spirit in him. The same thing that I got. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in me. The same as it does in you. The same as it does in Jesus. He is seated in heavenly places right now. And I am seated with him because I'm not bound by this earth or this flesh. Just my flesh is bound. Just my body is bound. But my spirit can astral travel like nobody's business. Amen. I can have out-of-body experiences without going to to some seminar. The fact is, when we're really in in what I would say is is deep prayer, or whenever you have uh, uh, visions... Dreams, you're, those are out-of-body experiences because you're disconnected from the flesh. You're disconnected from the body. Exactly. You're not aware of your body, in other words. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. Power over all flesh. Praise the Lord. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 19. See, we, how are you going to get bold? You're, you're never going to get bold in this body. Not unless you can separate yourself from the body. You know what I'm saying? I, you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about hovering over yourself and seeing yourself. I'm saying delineate between who you really are and this body. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Amen? Amen? Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. This, that's why it always sounds so bizarre when you read this because we're thinking in terms of the natural. And we're not natural. When you get revelation, you don't get revelation through your intellect. It comes by the Spirit. It comes to your intellect, but it doesn't come from your intellect. Because you've been reading that crap for years and years and years. I don't mean crap in the sense it's crap. I mean, you know, just the the monotony of it and don't get anything out of it and then all of a sudden one day bang you see something you never saw before did your brain just blow up or something I mean what happened you got the same brain cells you know if anything you're losing some even though they're regenerating you're losing some I know you are I've talked to you praise the Lord (laughs) amen but I'm saying something has to happen outside of the natural intellect right because people read the Bible all the time don't get anything out of it we know people that have, re- we know theologians, people that are teaching in Bible colleges who don't know what we know. Right. Amen. It came from somewhere because they got more brain than I got. I mean, they have more intellect maybe than I've got, but they don't have more understanding because they're not supernatural. They're not operating from the supernatural. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, let me ask you something. Is this the cart or the horse? Are we looking at that and and thinking when the body of Jesus shows up again, I'm talking about the one singular body of Jesus, shows up again, who's our life, when he appears, then we'll also appear with him in glory? Or is that Christ you? who is our life, when he appears, all of a sudden, you'll realize I am he and he is me. We are one. And it's glory everywhere. That's supposed to happen here, not off in heaven. We don't need it in heaven. It'll just be a natural fact in heaven. We need it here. 
We need Christ who is my life to show up. Amen? So that I can appear to be who I really am so that God is glorified. So that miracles and the supernatural take place. So that what God has declared becomes reality. If we were to lose eternal life, it would mean we lose Jesus. If we lose Jesus, we lose eternal life. They are one and the same. Eternal life is Jesus. First John chapter 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hasn't got any life. The only life God actually acknowledges is spirit life. Because it's the only thing that's eternal. It's the only thing that came from Him. Flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the spirit is born of God. So we've got a natural body that came from our parents and our natural genealogy. But we have a spirit, which is our true identity that's going to live forever, and it came from the genealogy too, but there's only one in it. God. Uh Praise the Lord. It's His life. See, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Here's where we miss it a lot of times with religion. It's all about the death of Christ. And that's important. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. But it's his life, not merely his death, that saves us. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. Praise the Lord. You see, I understand this, so I'm not ridiculing anybody. Don't misunderstand me. Don't think I'm judging anybody. I've done it myself. and so. But we get these kind of crazy ways of saying things because they, they make sense to us naturally, uh-huh. even though we're trying to express something that's spiritual. Uh-huh. So we kind of fumble around sometimes with language. All of us do. I'm guilty all the time of it. You know, you just try to find the right word, and then you think later, oh, God, that, was a, that wasn't the right word. I shouldn't have used that because somebody can easily misinterpret what I'm saying and think I'm saying something. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's just, right. it's just a mess. We are what Winston Church or uh, George Patton said uh, uh, to, we talk, speaking of England and the United States, he said two uh, nations uh, divided by a common language. Uh-huh. It's the Lord. Well, that's... Kind of what we are here. You know, we're, we're one people divided by, you know, English. Because we just have a difficulty expressing ourselves. But there are, though, what I'm saying is people are saying that we need to hunger for more of God. You know, we need to thirst for more of Jesus. And it sounds good. It, it, it makes sense to us in the natural, right? I mean, but we think we're expressing something spiritual when, in fact, Jesus says something altogether different. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 35. Because that that language in itself gives us the idea that there's separation somehow. Uh Right? I mean, you're sowing into your own thinking that somehow God is distant from me and I need to, there's something I need to do to get this connection again, to get this closeness. Right? When in fact... I'm there. He's here. I am his. He is mine. We are one. Uh Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Uh He that believeth on me shall never thirst. You don't need to hunger for God. You just need to wake up to God's here. Uh The bread that I give them. It's not like the bread that they got from their fathers. 
that came down out of heaven and sustained them for a little while. The bread that I give them is eternal life. It'll last forever. You don't need any more of this bread. Amen? Amen. So here, rest in Christ. It's not about what we're doing. It's really about how we do it. How we do it is all that matters to God, not what we do. There's no law for what we do or a law against what we do. There's only a God who only acknowledges one way of doing it, and that's faith. Because we are spirits. We connect to God by faith, not, not through other things. We got to get past this stuff, you know. That's what I'm saying. That's why we keep talking about it and keep talking about it because there's residual. There's always this kind of hanging on of the flesh that always, you know, when you get to learn a certain way of doing things, your mind automatically dips to that thing. You know what I mean? If you've got a job and you've done it for years and years and years, and all of a sudden a weird situation pops up, you are programmed basically to do a certain thing in a circumstance. Without really thinking about it, you just immediately do it because you've got enough experience to know that's the right thing. I just, and you're not rationalizing or anything. You're just responding. That's what our natural man does. It, it relies back. It trips back to this residual kind of thought patterns. Not who we are, but our thinking. And religion has fed that to the point where we have become very adept at being non-spiritual. Very religious, just not spiritual. Well, not being spiritual is death. So it's not about what we're doing. It's, it's, the only thing that matters to God is how we do it. Praise the Lord. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Not what you do or not what you didn't do. But faith, which worketh by love. You can be circumcised probably, I'm just guessing because I'm not a doctor, but I would guess 60, 70 percent of the American males are circumcised. Is there any act of faith in that? By their parents when they were circumcised or by themselves if they got older and, and, and were circumcised? No. So circumcision doesn't mean anything. No. Right. No. Being uncircumcised doesn't mean anything. The only thing that makes any difference is your faith. Yes. Now, he just uses circumcision as an example, but it's any law, any, any rule would be the same thing. Mm-hmm. The only thing God, God doesn't care about what, what it is you're doing. He cares about Why you're doing it. Amen. How we do what we do makes all the difference in the world. When it comes to praying for people, when it comes to prophesying, any spiritual act, the bottom line is it's about how we do it. Not so much what we're doing, because that's the only thing God's paying any attention to. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now leave it there for just a minute. This is what got me going on this whole message. Because I wrestled with this, just diligently seek him. And I'm thinking, what, how do I reconcile that? If we're not to hunger and thirst after God, how is it we diligently seek him? If, if without faith it's impossible to please him, it makes it sound as though this is a, you know, a, 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 a kind of a counterbalance in a way that it's offsetting one another because if there's no, without faith it's impossible to please him, but then I've got to diligently seek him. If I'm diligently seeking him, where's the faith in that? Except that I know that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But here's what I found out. That word diligently is exetio, the Greek, 
And it, it's a root word that comes from, the, the number is 1537 if you want to look it up in concordance. And here's what it actually means. The literal meaning of it is the point whence motion or action proceeds. So without faith it's impossible to please God. For him that comes to God must believe that he is the source, that he is the point from which everything moves from. Every action comes out of this. So I'm not, it's not diligently seeking him in the sense that I'm, oh, God, please come back or show up or do something. No, it's me being aware and conscious that he is the force that moves everything. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about what I'm doing. It's talking about what he's doing. Yes, Lord. So in other words, the reason it fits is because faith, without faith it's impossible to please God, and when I exercise my faith, what I'm actually doing is knowing that in him I live and move and have my being. That's my diligently seeking is my simple awareness of resting in him and what he does. He motivates everything. He makes everything. He puts everything in motion. Everything of the spirit is of God. And that's what I have to acknowledge. That's what I'm doing when I'm diligently seeking God. It's not that I'm trying to find him. It's my resting in him as the source for everything. That makes sense to you? That's because that takes faith. Amen? And that's what he wants. He wants to be the source. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, that scripture that we just read before is a parallel scripture. When you read it in that context, it becomes a parallel scripture to that I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. But by me, you bear fruit. It's not your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, but it comes through you. Yeah. Why? How does that happen? It happens because you rely on the vine. Uh -huh. You diligently seek. In other words, you look to God and expect God to do what God says He's going to do, and from that faith, He moves. Uh -huh. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is the source of everything. Yes. He is the great I Am. He is the... You know, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. I mean, look at him. He's all of that. Okay, one more scripture real quick. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. You all probably all familiar with this. It's, it's about the woman, uh, her husband dies. She's got two little kids. The, the bill collectors come to the door. They're banging on the door. She goes to Elijah and said, hey, my husband was one of your sons of the prophets. He died, and now the bill collectors have come, the creditors are here, and they're going to take my two sons because I can't pay them. I don't have anything. I can, there's nothing I can give. So Elijah says, well, what do you got? She says, I got a, a little cruise of oil. I got a little vial of oil. And he, said, he says then, then go to all your neighbors and just start grabbing up every jar, every container, anything you can find. Take it back to the house, shut the door, and start pouring oil. So here's the result. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said to her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed or the oil stopped. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay that debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Yes. The, 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 just the, the whole point of the story is there is no limit to the source. Yes. The source only stops when we run out of vessels. Right. In other words, when we stop believing, God stops producing. Mm -hmm. he, 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 there's no limit to God. Amen. The limit is always us, our expectation, our faith. And that's why this faith is such a critical message. By grace are you saved through faith. Yet not of yourself, but of God. So that none of us can boast. It's why it's so important. It's critical. It is if, 
if I could say it, it, it is the one thing that we have to have and have to have it so settled and so sure because without it, we limit God all the time. We're, why? Because we look at ourselves instead of looking at God. And immediately, we start setting limitations. Right? Well, he can heal a cold, but cancer? Come on. God can do anything. God can do everything. But we limit him because we run out of vessels. Right? We just run out of an expectation for him to keep pouring out. Earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But it's not to be limited to this earthen vessel. Praise the Lord. What does a vessel do, by the way? I mean, does it go looking for oil? Does it beg for oil? Does it say, please put your oil in me? It just receives it. All it does is just sit there and get the oil. It's a perfect metaphor for grace. Where sin abounds, my grace doth that much more abound. You are the righteousness of God. You ought to expect your vessel, you ought to expect oil to just be pouring out of you. Oil is just another type of the Holy Spirit. But I'm just saying, whatever your need is, whatever the situation you're confronted with, here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Right? Remember those old songs? There's some theology behind it. My cup runneth over. Why? Because David believed God for anything in spite of David. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. Because he knew God's goodness wasn't measured by David's goodness or by David's evil. It was simply God, the source of all things good. Amen? Amen. So why not live by faith in Christ, the vine? Amen? Amen. Why not, you know, take a break and let God start doing some stuff? Amen. Amen? Amen? That church is your destiny according to the Bible. Your destiny is to simply watch the fruit come from the vine right through you. Amen? Your spirit has every bit of the fruit that the Bible talks about already there. Right? I mean, the scripture tells us. He's given us these gifts. And they're all free. So if we're not seeing them, it's because no vessel. Right? I mean, there's nothing, there's no expectation. I'm telling you, God's going to do this. He's going to do this last day supernatural outpouring, tremendous breakthroughs. I mean, just unbelievable in the natural. God's going to do it. He's just, he's just waiting on the vessel. He's just The oil is there to be poured. There's no limit to the oil. There's no limit to God's power and His Spirit. There's only a limitation that we've placed. I, I'm just saying, in the Spirit, how about let's, let's gather some vessels, spiritually speaking. I'm saying let's get every, every expectation, let's have every reason to believe, amen, that God is just going to start pouring it in and pouring it in and pouring it in, and He's not going to stop because we're not going to stop expecting it. That's when this world, that's when this world is going to see the revival that God has promised. It's actually an end-time harvest. And as Don said here a while back, we're the reaper. We're, we're, the, we're the vessel. We're the tool that God's going to use. Amen? So pour it out, Lord. Just pour it out. Amen? On your righteous servant. How about that? You read that in the Old Testament, you think, how, can they, how, how dare they even say that? Because there was no way for them to be righteous. How much more should we be saying? Just do it, Lord. 
do it for your righteous servant. Hallelujah. Jesus said it. That's what Jesus did. Father, I know you always hear me. This is for them. You know, I know you're hearing me because I'm righteous. I came from you. But this is for their benefit to know that it's you that's doing it. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just, uh, let's try to exhaust the source. I think it'd be fun. I think God'd get a kick out of that. Look at them. Look at them. They're trying to use it all up, and they're in it. There's no end to it. You go, kid. Just go for it. Just, just keep taking it all you can take. Amen. Isn't that what the scripture says? Yeah. Amen. The, the more you receive, the more you can expect. It's, it's when we start doubting, then it seems like God runs dry. He's not, he, he never runs dry. We, we just think, this is just too much for me. I mean, this is just too good. I can't expect God to be good. Hey, God, he wants to, he wants to spoil you rotten. Amen? Amen. Amen. How, how, why does he say, love others as you love yourself? Amen. And we get all awkward about that. I'm not talking about arrogance and pride. I'm talking about loving the reality and the truth of what I am and who I am in Christ. Amen? Amen. I have a right to expect good stuff. I have a right to expect good things to happen. I have a right to expect things to take place in my life, just like Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Amen. I I just think of it like the, the church before us, that was Elijah. That was John the Baptist. It was making the didn't have perfect theology. It was trying to point people to Jesus. At some point, somebody has to recognize, like Jesus did, I am He. That's what I'm saying. Get, just get bold. Get, just get out there and say, it's, it's me. I am He. I am has shown up. And He showed up in you. And he's wanting to show out. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give him that opportunity. Let's give him the glory. Yes. Instead of just talking about it, let's literally do it. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. God bless you all. Have a great Memorial Day. Remember the fallen, those that have served. And uh, have a great week. See you Wednesday, hopefully. Praise the Lord.